So you just added period into your notes here. So a couple of details here. Notice it's talking about the horizontal distance that's needed to complete a cycle. Since we're talking about the horizontal distance, another way to think about period is basically the width of our waves. It's the same idea. So in other words, how long does it take to start repeating itself as we go over? And again, the idea here is, is it's one full cycle of a periodic function. Remember, periodic functions that we're working with right now are sine and cosine. Those are the only two that we've dealt with up to this point at least. All right, and then this is the next set of notes. So as you take a look at this, so let's see some little details about what it is that you've added here. So notice here in both equations we have b representing that number that's multiplied by theta or x, the same thing works with x. And you notice since they're both sine of b theta and cosine of b theta, it means that this rule works exactly the same whether you're dealing with sine or cosine. All right, so in order to change the period, it happens when we multiply the x or the theta by something. We multiply the variable by some number. So B is the number of cycles completed within a normal cycle. And notice I put down here what a normal cycle is, because it does depend on if we're working with degrees or radians. A normal cycle in degrees, we normally complete our full graph, the whole up and down process, between 0 and 360. So that's why it's 360 degrees normally. Or 2 pi, because of course 2 pi is equivalent to 360 degrees when we're dealing with radians. And so, for instance, what if it was 2? What if B was 2 here? That would mean that it would complete two cycles between the normal 0 and 360. That's how we get these formulas down here. Because I take whatever I normally complete it in, so like 360 degrees, and I divide it by the number. Because if it's 2, I completed two cycles between 0 and 360. That means each cycle must be 180 degrees wide. Notice we're getting that by doing 360 divided by the 2. So 360 divided by b or 2 pi divided by b can always tell us what that period is. In other words, how wide the wave should be. All right, so here's a couple examples to also have in your notes. So notice what's happening with the 2 theta there. When we multiplied it by 2, in order to find out how wide each cycle is, that means I'm doing 360 divided by 2, so each one is 180 degrees. That way I can fit 2 in between the normal and 360. Uh, the second one, sometimes the one half throws people off because I end up doing 360 divided by a half there. I'm only completing half of a cycle between 0 and 360. Well, if I only complete half between 0 and 360, that means it must take twice as long to complete it which is why it's 720. If dividing by the fraction gives you a little bit of trouble, remember 360 divided by a half is the same as 360 times 2 over 1 because we multiply by the reciprocal. All right, next up we're going to practice a little bit of graphing. So first up, let's deal with the stuff that's kind of the older and more familiar. Where's the midline of this graph? Yep, the midline comes from what's added or subtracted on the end here. There's nothing there. So the midline is at zero. So I'm going ahead and drawing in a dotted line for my midline. And then what's my amplitude for this equation? It is one, yes. Because remember, sine is one times sine. So that means I'm going to have a dotted line that's one up. On my scale up here, that's there. Check your scale on yours. Just go by a single hash mark. That's fine. So we start by drawing in those dotted lines. That way we can focus on knowing where the top, middle, and bottom are from those. And we don't have to like try to remember what those numbers are as we go from there. Now we got to deal with the new stuff. The 2 there. The 2 is changing our graph here. Remember that it made my period to be 180 degrees instead of the normal 360. So whenever I go over a point, I'm only going to go over half as far. So let's start plotting some points. My first point at 0, it's sine. It starts in the middle. So I'm actually going to put a point there at 0, 0. 
because sine starts in the middle and then sine goes up. Well, normally when I go up though, that would mean my next point would go there, but it's not going to in this case. Because remember, I changed my period. I'm only going over half as far. So instead of going over 90 degrees to my next point, I'm going to go over 45 degrees. Halfway between 0 and 90. That's where the top now is. And I'm just going to keep plotting my points for sine like I normally would, except they're going every 45 degrees now instead of every 90 degrees. So I went 0, 45, next up is 90. Next up after that is 135 degrees, which is exactly halfway between 90 and 180. And then after that would be 180. That's enough to show me what this graph is looking like in that interval at least. So I have this much graph. I've now graphed one complete cycle. But that complete cycle is now taking place entirely between 0 and 180 degrees. But I have more graph than that. Because this graph scale did go out to 360 degrees. So I need to fill it out. I'm just going to continue the same pattern, again, putting points every 45 degrees. So back to top, middle, bottom and middle to finish out making my graph here. So this is what you should be looking at on your own paper. And as you write that down, notice, yes, this graph does go on forever in both directions. That's why we can just fill the grid. So if I wanted to keep going with it, I would be able to just keep going in both directions if I had more graphing grid available. So we made this graph using the same scale that we've been using for all of the other graphs. We graphed it from 0 to 360. But there's another way to deal with that. Above your next graphing grid, please write the same equation, y equals sine of 2 theta, but we're not going to go by the same axis label. So Remember when we actually plotted the points? I didn't plot a point every 90 degrees. I plotted a point every 45 degrees. So I'm going to label my x-axis here going up by 45 degree increments instead of by 90 degree increments. So that means your first hash mark, the first point where you're going to be putting a point, is 45. And then I'm just going to keep adding 45 to that. So that's 90. 90 plus 45 is 135. And 135 plus 45 is 180. And now I can again graph based on this scale. Step one, of course, nothing has actually changed about this, so the midline is still at zero. And my amplitude is still up and down one. All right, so. Now that I've done that, I can start making my graph a sine. Sine still starts in the middle, so I put a point at 0, 0. But then because of the 2, I'm putting a point every 45 degrees now. But since I changed my scale, that's actually at one of those nice, pretty points that we have there. So you put your next point at 45 degrees at the top. And then 90 degrees, it's back to the middle. 135 degrees, it's at the bottom and 180 degrees back to the middle again. And so then we can make our graph. Now if we did not change the scale here, this would be the exact same thing as just sine of theta, our parent function. So be aware that by changing the scale, you are giving yourself a slightly distorted view of the graph. You're only looking at half of what you used to look at. And since this is the first section where we're really messing with this, that's good to keep in mind because all the others, you've always had the same view. All right, so we're now going to be graphing this one. And again, we're going to walk through the same process. I'm going to start by plotting my midline. Where is my midline in this one? It is at 1, yes, which is going to be right up here for me. So here's my midline. 
because the midline is always whatever is added or subtracted onto the end. And then what is my amplitude for this problem? It is three, yes. So from my midline, I count up three and put the top line in, always dotted here. And then I count down three to put in the bottom line. Again, still dotted. All those are dotted because they are guides. Kind of like when we drew in the asymptotes, but of course, remember, these are not asymptotes. They're just guides. Has a different kind of a meaning. All right. Now, we need to start graphing it, and I haven't used the one-half yet. What does the one-half do? It, yeah, it, it does stretch it horizontally, right? Ah, notice. These period changes are horizontal stretches and compressions. This is the first graph we've seen this year that actually has a horizontal stretch or compression for us to graph as part of it. All right, so in this case, though, the one half. Does it make it wider or more narrow? It makes it wider, yeah. So that means I want to label my scale. And I want to make it wider. So instead of putting a point every 90 degrees, I'm going to put a point every 180 degrees. Because it's going to be twice as wide. And so each hash mark I make, I'm going to add another 180. So the next one then is 360 degrees, then 540 degrees, and finally 720 degrees. So we're messing with the scale here, but now that I've done that, I can graph my sign like normal. For graphing sign, I start in the middle, and then my next point goes at the top. It's just that my next point is at 180 this time instead of at 90. But by labeling my axis accordingly, it's still going to look just like it did with 90, just with different numbers on the axis. All right, keep plotting them at 360. We're back at middle, 540 at the bottom and 720 in the middle. Go ahead and draw your curve that goes through those points. And so then this is the curve you should be looking at for this. Now, one little note, this is of course just showing between 0 and 720. If I would given you the same graph to make on the old axes to where you had to go between 0 and 360 only, notice in that kind of a case you would only be seeing this part of the graph. So if you're doing this on a normal scale, you'd be going between 0 and 360, and so that whole thing would just be stretched out, and you'd only see like that one part of the graph. So sometimes you'll be given the scale, and you'll only graph that part of it. Other times you'll need to make the scale, and you'll see the whole thing. All right, this is the last graph we're going to make together today. So please write this equation above your next graphing grid. And as you do so, notice that by going from theta to x here, I've now switched over to radians. So we're going to be seeing how do we deal with it when we're in radians instead of degrees. Because, of course, radians tend to look a little uglier, and degrees tend to look a little prettier. All right. Let's just start the same way we start all of them. First up, midline. What is our midline in this one? It is zero because we got a zero added on to the end there. It helped if I was actually in the pen mode instead of the highlighter. We got that zero at the end. So I'm going to start by putting in my midline at zero. What's my amplitude here? Amplitude is four because it's whatever is multiplied out front. So I'm going to go up four, dotted line. Down four, dotted line. That way I can see where my top and bottom are. All right, next up, let's go ahead and deal with that scale. The two. The two means this whole thing is being compressed in, right? So I'm actually going to be completing two full cycles in the normal two pi. Well, that means a single cycle is half as wide. What's two pi divided by two? It is pi. So that means that this last hash mark, 
is pi. Because I want to show one full cycle here, and one full cycle is pi wide. Knowing that, then, I can start filling in the rest. So, for instance, what's halfway between 0 and pi? It's half of pi, which is pi over 2. Okay, now the one that sometimes can be a little tricky for a few people. What's halfway between 0 and 2 pi right here? Well, it's half of a half, which is a fourth. So that is going to be pi over 4. And now the way you can know that, by the way, if pi is out here and I'm cutting this whole thing up into four pieces, pi over 4. All right, so if this is pi over 4, this was really 2 pi over 4. And that reduced to pi over 2. So then this one has got to be 3 pi over 4. It's 3 fourths of the way to pi. So 3 pi over 4. That's the tricky part with this today. Is just saying, what do I need to label that axis? Because once I have it labeled, it's the regular old cosine graph. And notice, yes, I've given you cosine again. This one's not sine. Where does cosine start? Top, middle, or bottom? Top, absolutely. So first point at zero goes at the top, which is up at four. From the top, I go to the middle. And notice I'm spacing it over to pi over four, but because I changed my axis, it's still at one of those nice, pretty hash marks on your graphing grid. And then pi over two is next. That's got to be at the bottom. Three pi over four is middle. And finally, pi is back to the top which is what we should see because if it's going to complete a full cycle between 0 and pi, when I get to pi, I should be back to where I started from. That means I've completed the full cycle. And then once you have that curve drawn, you are done with that graph. All right, so now having done that, there's only one last thing we're going to do today, and that's one more piece of notes. Because now that we have these period changes in there, which is basically the equivalent of a horizontal shift or horizontal stretch or compression. We actually see something a little bit more complicated happen when we were given an equation with everything in it. This is what the general equation would look like. Now notice in this general equation, I have my B, which is what I've been dealing with today. But when we have a horizontal shift, notice there's that extra set of parentheses in there. This is how it needs to be for B and H to properly represent what they represent. If that B was distributed in, we'd actually have to factor it back out to be able to know what H is. So that's a little bit of a tricky thing. Go ahead and add all of this to your notes. And yes, for whatever reason, all of a sudden when we deal with sine and cosine, there's special vocabulary words for every single one of these transformations that we have known in other terms this year.